Almighty pod me home. Religion, science, myths, and legends all point toward the next evolution in human consciousness. What do the invisible realms hold? Who's telling us and how do they know? We are investigating insights from around the world to answer the question, what does the material world arise out of and where do we go once we've dropped the body? You're about to go interdimension with Robert Wallace and Adam Jeffrey to Undiscovered my Spiritual own, Realities. My own brother, sister. Yeah, same here. Mentally, mentally, we are safe. Oh, right. We are safe. Does having Physically, dominion over the lower kingdoms it's of nature simply, mean we have the right to kill insects or any other animal because we're afraid of them? Adam? Well, it doesn't look like we have Adam on the line right now. Uh, we also have a uh, synchronicity and coincidence coming up. How do the outer, uh, how the outer reflects the inner and the moment, the past and future. Adam? Hello. Hey, hey Robert. Hey, so now uh, we're just going through the, the top points of the day. We're gonna talk about altering your consciousness, how simple meditation can warp your world. Then living forever? Sound boring? That means you're boring. And finally, <laughs> right thinking according to right thinkers. Welcome back to Spiritual Realities. This is Robert Wallace. We have Adam Jeffrey in the line because he's unable to uh, personally partake in the festivities here as he is <laughs> on site in his living room. Adam, Indeed. we had a nice, Hello. we had a nice little chat uh, this weekend when we were at the Smoky Mountains. And we I, did. That was great to get to see you out there. What a happy coincidence. Absolutely. So it was, it was a beautiful coincidence. Yes. So uh, today we're going to be talking about some things which I feel like are partly inspired by the events that took place out there. And right off the bat, I'm thinking about the ladybugs, which did not die in my windowsill because I set them free. <laughs> Adam, how small That's awesome. how small of a life is too small of a life uh, to care about? Well, you're asking this question of, of a vegan, <laughs> <laughs> um, of a guy and his family who have been passionately committed to veganism for uh, about a decade now. So we, uh, we believe that all life forms are sacred and precious. I love it. Um, yeah, that every sentient being matters, uh, and every living soul is important to God. And so every living soul is important to us. That's right. And that's how I feel. Uh, I was actually just talking to DeLois before uh, we went on here, who's the producer. She's standing by, DeLois. Hello there, Robert and Hello. Adam. Hello, DeLois. Hello there. And we were talking about, uh, you know, animals like ladybugs or spiders, for instance. And, you know, it's pretty common for people to see them, to want to smash them dead. I don't feel like that's right. Uh, and it reminds me of the story of the little girl who goes along the coastal shore and she's seeing all the starfish. And she's picking them up, throwing them back in. And mother says, you know, most of those are going to die. And so she says, but for that one that I just threw in, it made a world of difference. And for this one, it makes a world of difference. And for this one. And as I was letting those uh, ladybugs out of that glass door, I was thinking about all the massive communities that would exponentially come off of that one ladybug whose life was saved. Wow. I think about it as sort of a, a speciest sort of prejudice. When we look at a bug and we determine that it's eight legs or eight eyeballs or six legs or whatever the case is, makes it undeserving of life. It makes it somehow inferior. 
in spite of the fact that it's a manifestation of ideas and qualities of God, the Lois says her opinion will never change. A a bug in her presence is a dead bug, guaranteed. <laughs> yes, Adam. I if I see a bug that's in my house, I am likely to kill it. And if it's too big, I will get my mom to kill it for me. She does uh, it every time. See, I can't help but think about maybe an intermediary life. Let's say, okay, you know, I die and I've got a little bit of karma from bug smashing. And now I got to come back as a bug for just a day or two so I can be smashed <laughs> by, you know, DeLewis's uh, progeny or whatever. And I'm thinking, do I want to be smashed or do I want the giant to <laughs> let down his giant finger and let me crawl up on it and then let me into the sky? There you go. And and there is there's the uh, the the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm. And here here's the interesting thing about that. I've I've always found this interesting that in in the biblical language, wherever it happens, whether it's there where it says do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or whether it's when you hear you shall not kill in the 10 commandments. There's no speci- there's no specification that this has to be humans that we're talking about. Do not kill. It doesn't say do not kill humans. Right. It says do not kill. And it doesn't say do unto other humans as you would have them do unto you. It says do unto others. So this, it's not specific about the living being that we're talking about here. So I, I would agree with what you're saying, Robert. It's like if you were in the position of the bug, how would you want the giant to treat you? I mean, God's a giant to us. I mean, he could smash us out just by forgetting us. Ah, oh, this is true. This is true. It's if, true. If it makes it feel any better, my roommate saved about five bugs in our roommate it suite. Okay. Like I was like, come on, Lauren, to help <laughs> it get out the house. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, hey, I have to admit that um, in my journey, I have had to overcome um, a pretty intense fear of spiders. Mm-hmm. arachnophobia oh, a pretty fear intense spiders? fear of spiders yes oh. I, I have struggled with arachnophobia for most of my life and and even to this day i i sometimes will look at them and and start to feel fear and i have to kind of stop myself and take a deep breath and say this is not rational there, there's no reason for me to be afraid of that spider i mean even if it's poisonous you know and, and it's over there and i'm here take a deep breath you know and, and at that point i get a container and put the spider into the container and carry it outside. That's right. Mm-hmm. Or, or just simply walk away from where it is if, if it's not affecting me. You know. Were you traumatized by spider spiders? Um, I don't have any specific memory of being traumatized by them. Um, but I, so I, I honestly don't know where that comes from. At this point in my journey, I just think of it as an irrational fear that I've had to learn to overcome and let go of. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Yeah, I have a little, uh, I have a plastic cup at home. I've written the Bug Cup 3000. And, and that <laughs> quote, you just, you just pointed out, thou shalt not kill, written right, upon it. Right, right. Um, there you go. I mean, and even if a bug is biting me, I really try hard just to blow it off and not kill it dead because it's doing what bugs do. Wow. And and I'm not like some, you know, extreme Buddhist or anything, but I just can't help but think, you know, we wield so much power and we just think of it nothing to, you know, black out a piece of life, you know, out of whim or out of convenience. Right. Man, you know, we can't operate life that way. Right. And, you know, the thing is, we we are very humans are very anthropocentric. We were very focused typically um societally you know i mean uh, the fact that most people in our society do eat meat they do eat animals and they don't think much of it i mean it's the way that i was brought up and most of the people that i know were brought up and uh, even just a little over a decade ago i, I was the guy going hmm, i'll never stop eating meat i'll never stop eating animals mm. um and and you know that's that's been a pretty significant journey for me to uh, go from the guy who said, oh, I will never stop eating meat, to becoming um, a guy who's so passionate about it that my family and I now co-own uh, a 
vegan restaurant here in Memphis. <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. um, and, and what's really cool is to not only see my own journey in that, but um, one of the cool things about having this place here in Memphis is that we have had so many amazing conversations with people on similar journeys. And uh, I, I, one guy always comes to mind with this particular topic. Um, and he's about a six foot five, 250 pound muscle dude that comes into the restaurant. I won't say his name, but he's a, a great guy, really nice guy. But his journey started in veganism because of the health issue. Uh, he wanted to lower his cholesterol and become healthier. And um, a couple of years later, he, he walked in one day. Now, I remind you, this this is a, a big, huge, muscular, strong guy. He comes in and he goes, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, cool. What's up? You know, we sit down and he's like, I don't know what's going on with me. He's like, I, I've gotten so sentimental about this issue, this vegan issue. It used to be just a health thing for me, but now I'm carrying bugs outside of my house. Aww. I can't, you know, I just, <laughs> I didn't know whether to cry or laugh or both. I, <laughs> such a beautiful thing because there's this shift in consciousness that happens. Even if you start it very, if you start this journey from a very self-focused perspective, something still shifts in your consciousness, whether you realize it or not, that that basically says, man, life does not center around me. It does not center around humans. Um, all life is precious. Mm-hmm. And, and that shift of consciousness has happened in so many people's lives, even if they started just from a health perspective in, in the vegan journey or vegetarian journey. Uh, and I'm really grateful to have gotten to be a part of that, not only in my own life, but to see it happen in so many other lives here in Memphis. That's great. And I think you brought up a, a really good point um, that the deeper that we start to analyze our thoughts, because even in terms of where Rudolf Steiner is coming from, uh, animals, you know, they don't have the same consciousness as humans. And they are really like a bird is an idea of man. And because of the aramonic forces that make up materiality, it's crystallized into this form that we see as a bird. And, uh, you know, and along them lines, I should also point out that uh, if you've ever stopped and listened to the chirping of birds and actually paid attention to what you're thinking and feeling at the same time, you'll see a correlation between happy thoughts and happy bird chirps and sort of a foreboding sort of chirp that comes from a bird when we're thinking creeping thoughts, not pure thoughts. It's almost like being in a in a movie and all of a sudden the scene changes and the background noise changes and it's these birds. The Bible talks wow. about those who interpreted uh, bird flight paths. I don't know that it was recommended, but I know that uh, when I'm driving and I see a bird swipe fly right in front of my car from the left to the right, I noticed that my mind just changed on a matter. I just went from logical to turning it into an imaginative thought. Or if it went from the right to the left, an imaginative thought just became logical. And here this bird is, its actions are corresponding to the movement of my thoughts in my own head. And so then we look out into the distance and I kind of see thoughts that are further out you know, my thoughts that are further out are kind of, they're being manifested in these further out birds and realize that our entire space uh, dimensionally is filled with beings that correspond with our inner life. Mm-hmm. And mm. it, this is something that requires observation because it could, it's a, sound neurotic to somebody who has never observed it over and over and over. But in fact, this is how the world works. So you can call it law of attraction or whatever, but. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's at least the power of, of our thoughts, the creative power of our thoughts and the way we're interacting with each other um, as all living things. I think it's pretty beautiful. Yeah. And another thing we should point out is there is occasionally the need to put down an uh, innocent little creature and what is called a mercy kill. For instance, I uh, walk down my driveway and I noticed there was a bug. I look back, I realize it just stepped in half of it. Aww. Its leg <laughs> is damaged and I'm not going to, or its wing is damaged. I know what's going to happen. This thing isn't going to get around. It's going to go find a corner and it's eventually going to have to die out of starvation. So you got to make hard decisions too, you know? You got to give it right. a real quick snap. Did Set you it. kill it? I, I'll kill it. I'll pray and then I will 
slam my foot down as hard and oh. fast. I'll oh. slide it. I don't want any <laughs> remaining pulses going through this thing. It's out in a heartbeat. How do you know it couldn't, you know, walk away? Well, I do or... testing. I do testing. So I try to help it. If it's limping, if it's dragging, is it damaged? Is that wing uh -huh. damage? I already know it's fate. I have a story. This reminds me. It's not about a bug. It's about a rabbit. I was going to work on a back road and it was a rabbit in the middle of the street and his back legs weren't working. And I was like, Oh no, what's going on? And so I literally stopped traffic. I blew my horn so the rabbit could cross the street and it was just dragging his hind legs behind him. I felt so bad. But as long as it made it across the street and the traffic stopped, I was good. But that just <clears throat> came into my head. See, and I really appreciate that sentiment. I just wish we could feel the same way we feel about fuzzy little rabbits <laughs> when we're looking at an, you know, eight-eyed spider or some crazy other. It's not working for me. You know, I, I find it interesting too that I mean that's one of the many disconnects that we have as a human. And another disconnect to me is that it, this particular society that we live in, um, you know, we have dogs and cats as pets, and yet. We think it's okay to kill cows and pigs and chickens and eat them for food. Mm -hmm. But it would not be socially acceptable to kill that dog or that cat. Now, why is that? Who who made that decision along the way within our society and said, eat pigs and love dogs? I, it's a prejudice. Yeah, I think because, you know, dogs are men's best friend. But in some countries, they do eat dogs. And I think... Either it was Singapore or North Korea, they had like a dog festival where they would breed dogs and kill them for their meat, but they tried to ban it. It was recently, right. like, I think 2015, but I'm pretty sure like in the back rural areas, they probably do kill dogs and cats for meat, which is sad, but I guess in America, that's totally different from them. We have a more centralized location for our protein, as I should say. And, you know, I think whatever, you know, it's cute and fuzzy, so we allow ourselves to become sympathetic emotionally to mm -hmm. its sufferings, to its cries or whatever. We know that there's an inner life, a sentient life of pain or pleasure, and we identify with that. And it's out of that that, you know, we want to take care of it, make it feel better. But when you can't hear the cries of a little insect or a bug who's suffering silently, you know, um, the rules change, and that makes that makes us into uh, double-minded people. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we selectively mm -hmm. choose that it should die. All right. You know, I think that, mm -hmm. I, I think it, if I could add one more thing to this topic before we move on, um, I think that one thing that has happened over the years is, is we have, this idea of what dominion actually means has morphed so much from when it was first spoken biblically. I, I believe that the the original Hebrew idea and the various biblical models for dominion. Um, yep. Are you there, Adam? Yeah. Sorry, you broke up. Yeah, I, I'm here. Okay. 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 So the idea of dominion, you can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> the idea of dominion can also be one of relationship, as in one who is an authority over the other in a, in a loving authority though not in a oh you know you're here for me to kill and abuse and use but rather as as a parent is to a child you know i'm here to lovingly guide you and give you direction and help you and to watch over you you know that that is a form of dominion but this word dominion has morphed into something that we go, you know, we wouldn't say the word dominion when it comes to our children. Oh, no, 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 no. We, we're not in dominion over our children. But, you know, even the idea of authority sometimes has a very negative connotation to it. So these words carry these negative connotations. And I think that it's because of the horrific things that have happened over the years, um, you know, the, the atrocities that have happened when, when even humans enslave other humans. You know, I mean, that that unfortunately only happened a couple of hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And and since that time we have evolved and learned of course that's that was horrific and that was wrong. Um but I think that even a degree of that needs to come in into play with animals and, and maybe even insects. This idea that 
that dominion doesn't mean they are here for us to use and abuse and, and kill for our own selfish pleasure. But these these are our friends. These are our um, we, we are in relationship with them, and we are here to help them and guide them and to keep and observe and guard them um, in, in a mutual loving relationship. And I think it's important to remember too, uh, just because we have dominion over them, uh, like you said, it, it doesn't mean that we're simply endowed with the power to choose whether or not they live or die, but that we have a responsibility over them, maybe like a parent. You know, we are their caretaker. That. We're their, uh, you know, we get the executive say. So if anybody in that little bug's life uh, should have compassion and understanding for it, it should be those that have dominion over it. Um, so anyway, right. That that's right. a great I point. Like, yep. I love that. Uh, Adam, you know, a while ago you introduced me to a, a fun little term you call co coincidence. Uh, normally I prefer <laughs> synchronicity versus coincidence, but I think coincidence tells the same story there. And, uh, and it just reminds us how everything is working together behind the scenes when we're thinking uh, thoughts. I mean, in terms of the law of attraction, which most people who's listening knows what the law of attraction is, it says whatever you think about, you bring about. What your thoughts are always on, that's what's going to manifest. Ask, believe, and receive. Okay? So when yeah, things are yeah. co coming in and they're matching your inner thought life, now I know what you're thinking. Oh, you know, my Google does that too, and Alexa, and Siri, and they just, they're always bringing up stuff, whatever I'm thinking about. Oh, yeah, that's stuff you're talking about. But if we're paying attention <laughs> to our thoughts and our feelings, and, we re and we'll notice that things come into our lives through what might be termed happenstance, which directly and perfectly correspond with thoughts that we've held uh, that day or in the days prior, uh, so that it cannot be confused with, um, well, I guess, you know, happenstance or coincidence, uh, as it said, because it's obvious that there was some intelligence guiding it. So you could say it's a frequency guiding it, It's because it's a law. You could say that all perfect gifts come from the Father of Lights, and so it's God bringing. You know, He gives us the desires of our heart before we ask for them. Uh, but furthermore, how does the present moment reflect our past and our future? And I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but uh, Steiner uh, talks about how our environment consists of... Uh, elements which are both part of our future and part of our past and uh so if we look around we will see things that are reflections of places that we've been things that we've been into in the past and and so somehow they're here whether or not we've brought them literally from the past or they're showing up and then there's also elements surrounding you in your car or in your office or your home that are indications of what is to come because we have a stream coming from the past and a stream coming through from the future. And we're basically the condensation of these two streams, this present moment manifesting, you know, wow. all that has ever been, you know, uh, and all that will ever be already exists in the eternal mind and they're coalescing into this moment. And so, you know, not to take away anybody's free choice because we all have the option of free choice, but what is freedom of thought? Uh, and if you and again, we're talking, uh, I'm referring to Rudolf Steiner. He's got a book called philosophy of freedom or intuitive thinking as a spiritual path. And he discusses the concept of freedom uh, at length in that book. What we feel like is freedom. Oftentimes uh, choices that we get to or want to make, out of necessity, uh, things that we think that we've that we've chosen and brought about are actually also uh, not us, but there's there's other streams going on. So how do we originate something from scratch out of nowhere from our own imagination and build on it, as opposed to building on other things which have presented themselves as options or choosing uh, what is necessary for our survival? If that, that might sound kind of convoluted because I'm trying to cover a lot of points because the idea of free <laughs> choice is, you know, got a lot of uh, perspectives on it. So, that's deep. Everything you just said 
rest my brain to three, so I'm I'm really trying to process it all. That's good. <laughs> it's probably one of those things that are better left as a seed, that maybe at some point you can repose the question. Um, but... Yeah, yeah. I think it's good for discussion in the present too. Um, I, I've read a lot um, from Alan Watts on the topic too. He uh, he has said a lot of the exact same things or, or very similar things, at least of what you just said that, you know, Steiner's thoughts on it, uh, on w- what is free will um, versus, you know, it, w- what our choices are in the present moment, how, how much, you know, it, it pretty much exactly what you were just saying that Steiner said, Alan Watts says a lot of the same thing, you know? Yeah. Alan Watts is a pretty smart guy. And uh, <laughs> it's like the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. So, you know, even if it wasn't Steiner and Watts, it would have been somebody else who's, you know, already posed these questions. But uh, right, if, if anybody has ever experienced synchronicity in their life, I mean, from a personal level, I think this is almost the definition of a miracle. It supersedes Absolutely. what is possible in our normal day-to-day thinking. It supersedes what is probable, you know, by a long shot. And it really points out that there's something listening to the the background of our inner thought life for uh, something of, you know, usually of little significance to actually come out as a manifestation in front of us. And I think it just proves that uh, the invisible realm not only exists, is very active and alive and is, is working uh, between each thought and each thing that comes into our life, even if all we see is dead space and uh and it seems like everything isn't moving it's if there's things moving in the background every thought we have is cranking a new thought in somebody else's head every uh feeling of humility or pride is making a a a new decision for somebody else uh about you you know uh oh it's a sure thing that's why i say don't talk about things that aren't sure you know if you talk about it you'll jinx it sort of thing and maybe the decision maker because of your thoughts or assumption, all of a sudden they're turned off in your favor because of your expectation. Or perhaps you have a sense of humility, and all of a sudden now somebody wants to do something kind for you. They want to lighten up a a rule for you, or they want to make an exception for you because you've humbly accepted your position. So all of a sudden your inner thought life and and synchronicity, I mean, this is a, a matter of telepathy, uh, even more than that, our relationships with other people, the way we feel about people when we get close to them, does somebody give you a good vibe or a bad vibe? You know, mm. hey, look, God, but I don't trust them. Well, what's happening All in right. the inner thought life? They're not just attracting other feelings out of people. They're attracting their next circumstance or attracting the success or failure of their whatever they're doing. Thought is really the fulcrum. Uh, that everything hinges on. Absolutely. And more than that, I think, let's take it a step further, as Steiner and others point out, uh, thoughts are basically the most powerful faculty that you have available to you. More than what you can do with your hands is what you're capable of bringing about through your thinking. Mm. I think uh, Thoreau and Anderson, they they come to mind as well, if you've read much of what they had to say. But both of them said the, the same thing, that, Who's that? that thought has more power than anything that we can do with our hands. Yeah, it, pretty much exactly, again, what you just said, that thought is the greatest power that we have. And, oh. you know, I, I think also of the impersonal life, which we talked about um you know, I remember in the impersonal life, he says, to think is to create. As you think in your heart, so it is with you. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and he talks about this idea of giving certain thoughts power and releasing other thoughts and, and how important that is. And, and of course, all of the, the spiritual traditions and re- religions have been teaching that uh, for as long as there, there's been the idea of spirituality, um, the idea that that's what meditation and prayer centers around is that, you know, it's, again, we've talked about that before, the idea of spiritual warfare, uh, taking, you know, Paul said, your phone's breaking up, Adam. Oh man, I'm sorry. Try again. 
that last sentence. So I said, you know, he, you know, Paul in the New Testament said, take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. We've talked about this before, uh, the idea of spiritual warfare. A lot of that's happening right there in our mind and giving certain thoughts power and uh, releasing other thoughts. Right. Uh, I think, you know, the biggest focus of this show, philosophy, religion, spirituality, I think whether or not they use the term thought that often, it really all, it does come down to thought. Whether you're praying, whether it's self-talk, whether it's expectation, it's the one thing you can control uh, that can control everything else. So if you're neglecting your thought life, then you're basically, uh, you know, putting life on a random spinning wheel and hoping uh, for just whatever falls on your lap. Mm. I want to talk today also, which is the core theme of this show, the altering of consciousness via meditation. So can you trip on air, silence, and stillness? That'd be intense, man. Yes, you can. Silence, stillness, yeah. That's the best. Well, here's the thing. Life and you, the, what you're perceiving, everything begins to change. Everything can blur into one if all of a sudden you're gazing with no thought and stillness and, and again, mental silence, no, non-thought. And just being present. And if you have any thoughts about what you're looking at, let them be about the thing from the thing's perspective or issues that pertain mm. to the thing. I find myself beginning to uh, enter into this, uh, what I would call interdimensional state when I'm listening to other people. And this is something that we're going to be talking about here in more detail. But listening to other people and becoming inwardly still, renouncing all judgment and more importantly, all negative judgment about what's being said. So uh, you probably heard I th uh, that you know most people are just waiting for their their turn to talk. You're in a conversation right. with somebody. Uh, you're lucky if they're listening because what they're really listening to is the one statement that they keep repeating over and over in their head that they're going to unleash on you as soon as you stop talking, which means <clears throat> they weren't really listening. Uh, I mean. For the most part, they weren't listening perfectly. And when right. we really allow ourselves to listen to somebody, all of a sudden we move deeper into, in, in, into our conversation with them and visually things change. Visually, they either start glowing or they get really big or they seem to move far away. The room stretches out or they get really close. Just visual distortions, the beginning symptoms of an interdimensional a uh, shift of consciousness begin to happen again, not by doing anything, but by excluding things, not by adding, but by taking away the things that you normally would have to contribute by being still and silent. You become a, a channel and, and visually the spirit starts to channel itself unobstructed into uh, uh, visuals, which uh, are often reserved for intense psychedelic states uh, or uh, confusion, but I mean, I've never really fallen into that I can think of this state uh, before a, a clairvoyant schooling. So uh, perhaps it's happened to you, but if you want to replicate it, what you were doing that day when, you know, Miss Jameson went all, you know, out in the distance or got all big to you, know, a really weird thing happened to you, you're probably listening with a ton of attention and, and no other thought. And that practice creates effects like that. Mm. Some people don't know that. I, I wouldn't have known that if I wouldn't have had uh, started this meditation path, had these experiences, and then it just started happening to me. Nobody's talking about it. Wow. Wow. That's pretty deep stuff. You know, I, I find that in conversation, um, it, it's happening right here, right now. That, that this is work um, to to give your full attention to someone else when they're talking rather than planning ahead. And for me, it's a, it's a form of, of what we often call ego death um, because I have to be more concerned about hearing what you're saying and focusing on it and listening to it with my full attention rather than being concerned with the next thing that I'm going to say and, and how that's going to come across to you or to anyone else that's listening right now. So it, 
of dying to my self-importance to how is everyone else going to perceive Adam Jeffrey whenever I speak next, you know, it's it's dying to that and saying, actually what Robert Wallace is saying right now is more important. Um, I need to give my full attention to that because he's speaking in the present moment. Yes. And you know, I'm glad you point that out because it is like you said, along the lines of ego death, you're taking a chance that after the person's done talking, you won't have anything prepared to say. It, right. It reminds me of the Bible when it says, don't think ahead what you'll say to the judges when you're brought up. Don't plan out ahead what you're going to say. Let the, the spirit come out of you. Now, this isn't the same as, you know, end times, you know, being brought before the judges sort of thing. But it's the same thing in terms of, you know, relying on the spirit to uh, succinctly put everything together in your head to give you a thought that you can share that's meaningful and appropriate. Uh, when it's time, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of what, you know, makes this show or, you know, something like this kind of difficult at times because, you know, we have the amount of time where we're speaking and, and we're live right now. And if we don't have ideas ready to talk about, we could end up uh, off in our imagination spinning our wheels. Could you imagine that? So then there's kind of the necessity to have sort of things kind of lined up. So a pre-planning action is taking place to make this happen. So there's something else to talk about next. And so I think there's a a place for a jumping off point when it comes to bringing ideas to the table, but then letting yourself speak inspired by the subject after that. So... It's one thing to introduce an idea, and it's another thing to read the entire time uh, versus sharing whatever that has uh, provoked in your head. The next thing, the next jumping Love off. Love that. Uh huh. Oh, sorry, I, I just to say I have to say that one thing that I love about that about this show is Christy and I were just talking about maybe talking. But I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, say, say that again. We had a little breakup again. So, oh, okay, sorry. So just this morning, and this is synchronicity and coincidence here playing out. That's that's part of what I love about this show is that, you know, just this morning, Christy and I were talking, and she said, what, what are you guys going to be talking about today? And I said, well, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that is that is the fun part of it for me is that usually you, you give me the talking points and the, where we're going to jump off just a few minutes before we go on. And, and I love that because then I, it's more spontaneous and there is this level of ego death. I have nothing prepared to bring to the table. So it's, I, I get to do a whole lot of listening and then allow the coincidence. to. Yes. And I, you know, that's funny that you bring that up. Um, because another thing that comes to mind is lately, you know, when I listen to uh, the sermons uh, from some of my uh, you know, f- favorite preachers or some of the other programs that are happening, even on the same day that are being uh, talked about all over in churches or organizations as we speak. And I used to, and I noticed this as a, a regular church parishioner too. I'd go to one church and coincidentally or synchronistically, somebody else at another church would be talking on almost the exact same topic. And wow. the, this one, they're over here and these guys are over here. And so what is this uh, correspondence? How is it that everybody's kind of on the same page? And I think it's the spirit uh, bringing up the message of, to the churches. So as long as, you know, whoever is speaking is open to modifying their uh, topic or to allowing whatever really comes into their head to come out constructively, at the end of the day, we're going to find a lot of us were talking on the same themes. Mm. And yet we weren't communicating, but the spirit was coordinating the whole thing in the background. And (laughs) that is so amazing. It is. And so I'm thinking, is this an, you know, astrological zodiacal zodiac i can't say that right now it there's <laughs> zodiacal Is sure that... i'll take that as best uh you know what what are the forces in the in, that are pushing down the themes on us you know like i can mm-hmm. i can think i've originated something but i haven't originated anything you know these ideas uh that i've settled with things that appeal you know 
they they come inspired from uh, uh, another realm, you know. Otherwise, I would just as well not come up with anything. So I think there is absolutely uh, a correspondence across the board with inspired yeah. thought. Uh, Adam, people talk about living forever being unappealing. I think a lot of people who aren't particular, particularly spiritual or religious think that the idea of living forever in heaven and hell, or hell, I mean, obviously nobody wants to live forever in hell, uh, but you know, we've <laughs> talked about that. Um, they feel like it would be boring and it would just be good to live and then die after a point. Uh, but what are we worrying about is going to happen if we live forever? I think people think about their lives with the struggles and with the pains in a constant uh, rhythm, never-ending problems. But the trials and the tribulations of this life are very finite. And then in heaven, we'll have challenges, but then there's but then there's a bliss. So how can we think about eternal life in a way that doesn't sound like it's going to be problematic later on? Like we'll get bored. Mm -hmm. I think people naturally want to live. So, I mean, I think it's natural to be, you know, happy because you're alive. But then there's some people who are not happy in their lives. Mm. That's a good point. Um, so how do they find what would make them want to live forever. Mm -hmm. You know, would they want to continue in a miserable existence or, you know, what, what could, what could give them bliss for eternity? If you're Delois, it's popcorn. <laughs> she said in heaven, in heaven, she's going to have popcorn. This is true. <laughs> but uh, in reality, I think it's, there's a spiritual communion with all the other beings of the universe that we meld into so that we share a universal life. Mm. And, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And you're talking about what motivates you to live longer or to have an eternity. Oh, we're talking about what would make somebody think that living forever would be boring. And I don't know what it is. I don't even know why I'm bringing it up. Maybe I feel society. Like we're gonna Mm -hmm. will make you think it will be boring society exactly yeah. yeah society has really embraced death they've embraced the skull they've embraced uh. yolo they've embraced you know have your fun you know you only live once mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's i think that yeah. i think that part of what happens in society too is that um so many churches come across as boring to people. I hear this in conversations a lot. You know, people are like, man, if, if heaven is like church, that's boring. I, I don't necessarily want to spend eternity there, you know, um, standing around and just saying the same little thing over and over again or singing the same song over and over again or listening to the same monotone, boring thing. And it's that they, in their mind, they've had a boring, what they call boring experience here. And they and and their their idea is that's the way it's going to be in heaven, and so they think, well, heaven is eternally boring. Yeah, exactly. And you know, and it really comes down to a personal relationship with the information. Like if I read uh, the Bible, or if I read a Rudolf Steiner book, and I'm like, it's exhilarating for me, and somebody else reads it, and they say, oh, that's dry and and boring. Our relationship to that information makes a world of difference. An engineer reads, you know, some engineering instruct instructions and is excited about the new technologies or something that they're going to use. And somebody else looks at it and, and finds it boring. So really, it comes down to our own personal relationship to the spiritual content uh, as to whether or not we're going to take something from it. Mm. Uh, you know, even the Bible talks about how... Uh, you know, even, uh, you know, God can use uh, the ignorant. He can use the simple to teach. So it doesn't even have anything to do with us as people, whether or not the content is of value. It has to do with the uh, listeners uh, who are capable of making use of it. Sometimes we hear uh, good advice, and yet, you know, we're dead to it, or it doesn't resonate at all. It doesn't mean anything to us. 
and somebody else is inspired by it. Right. So, yeah, we have individual responsibility to uh, think deeply on what we're hearing or reading and making use of it, finding a useful connection. Right thinking, according to right thinkers, who, who dares tell me what is right thinking? Who's that right thinker? I'm going to tell you. That's Rudolf Steiner, my <laughs> favorite guy. And if you don't know anything about him, he has 350 books that will tell you. And he gives very concise instruction on entering into spiritual dimensions based on his personal experiences. And the development of the chakras is core to his teaching. The chakras, as we know, are these lotus-flowered, lotus-petaled uh, flowers which exist uh, along the, the spine of the person. And these are called lotuses, even though they're not technically flowers. They look like spinning pinwheels. And depending on which chakra you're talking about, they have uh, so many uh, petals on them. So your Ajna, or your third eye chakra, has two petals on it. And when you go to the throat, I believe it has 12. And so each of these has so many allotted to it. I could be wrong in that one. And each one of these petals, though, represents a separate principle or idea. And once a person has refined that, all of a sudden it turns into a clairvoyant ability. So, mm. th so that all of these petals are now activated because somebody has cleaned away uh, what is uh, on those petals, and now they can light up, be colorful, and they spin, and now somebody has clairvoyant sight of another type. And so each one of these chakras gives a different clairvoyant view into another dimension. And I was just reading this from the uh, Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. It says, you need not seek the Christ, for when your heart is purified, the Christ will come and will abide with mm. you forevermore. So I think a lot of our struggles is trying to build up something instead of remove the, the nuisance or the noise that we've put there, which is getting in the way of what God has already created, which is already there. Mm. That's perfectly in line with um, when Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Uh, that immediately came to my mind, the idea that it's it's the purity of heart that allows us to see God. Yes, exactly. And the glass is uh, obscured by all of our uh, random thinking. Steiner says, be aware of your thoughts. Think only meaningful thoughts. Gradually learn to separate in your thoughts the essential from the non-essential, the eternal from the transitory, the truth from mere opinion. I think taking up a, a meaningful thought life is exciting. At first, it seems uh, senseless because your thoughts seem arbitrarily brought to you uh, by circumstances it makes you feel good or you or perhaps you want to go to the refrigerator so you say i'm going to go to the refrigerator and walk into the fridge and then you get your thing you sit back down and you're back in front of the tv uh but in reality it's an opportunity to uh, teach yourself and to unfurl the thoughts that you're having because there's lessons in there there's logic just by explaining out an idea to yourself you can actually learn new things by thinking, and I think we think it has to come from outside, but if we are willing to really break down our own thoughts and think rationally with them, then we're going to come up with brand new inspired thought. And isn't that how life works? So right. to say there isn't value in picking up your thoughts and you know going through them piece by piece, I think it misses the, uh, the oil field right under our own feet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these ideas of right thinking that Steiner brings up are all designed to help somebody become more clairvoyant. And, and so you think that it, it doesn't matter if you're aware of your thoughts or if your thoughts are, are meaningful or not. Uh, but if you keep that in and you make that a, a paramount importance, then all of a sudden 
you're going to have spiritual dimensions start to appear lights and things start to appear in your vision that uh, will seem like hallucinations to the people around you. Um, Adam, everybody lives, everybody dies. Where are the dead right now? Mm. Where are they? Are they watching us? Are they busy with other chores? Um, I was just reading something online, and it was a quote from Steiner. And he was talking about, you know, when the dead die, they're a lot closer to us uh, than we realize. And some would even say even closer to us than when we are alive. And I think it's important to put ourselves in that position to think about what it would be like to be on the other side, seeing this world that can't see you, knocking on your loved one's, you know, door on their mind, standing next to them. It's like the movie Ghost, you know, they're with you, but if you only knew to intuit or to believe their presence, you might actually bring joy to both of you because it's painful for those on the other side to watch those who are living suffer, feeling like the other person's gone when they're standing right there, mm. trying to tell you that this life isn't the end, that consciousness continues after you die. Right. And... In our reflections on the subject, which is, it is important to contemplate death because it's going to happen. And there's a lot that we can prepare for that stage in our existence in this body that we can't prepare after we've died. Which is why people on the other side are so eager to have, get bodies and to come back and to do the things that they could only do with the five senses and with a body brain and all of this. Mm. And if we educate or if we inform our readings, if while we're studying our spiritual text, we kind of read it in the light of that, I think we'll find more significance and, and deeper meanings in the process uh, in what's explained about the afterlife. And that's really what's informed my search is keeping those questions about the state of the dead in front of my eyes in spite of not seeing anything, knowing what we all know that well, most of us know that A, there is a, a spiritual world or that we come out of a spiritual world and B, that we're all are going to return and live solely in that spiritual world. Even though that spiritual world of the astral plane, heaven, it exists all around us right now. Uh, so if we alter our consciousness, we could see it. If we drop the body, we're going to see it. Uh, but we should be preparing as though we're going to confront it because we are going to confront it. And that is what spiritual realities is all about uh, next week uh, we'll be talking more about the same and if you are not signed up to join us uh, on our list at newprecept.com or spiritualrealities.net facebook.com slash spiritual realities please go there like share and follow Adam you can also check out the work that uh, I'm doing in the world by my wife and I and our family at imagineveganCafe.com. And we have a vegan place here in Memphis. And then also we make music at 3dayflight.com. 3 Day Flight. Spiritual Realities. Email me, Robert at NewPrecept.com. If you have any ideas for another show or anything you want to hear talked about, or if you have an idea of somebody that we should be interviewing who is having interdimensional experiences. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Make your word your lover. CBS News at the top of every hour. Serving Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. This is The Voice KWAM Memphis.